So we'll talk now about what is it in particular about cats that uh, makes them such a, a, a stress-sensitive species. And I think this is where it's important to understand the cat and understand how they're different from the other veterinary species that we deal with and also how they're different from people. So I, I put a few characteristics of cats um, on this slide just to help us frame the, uh, the discussion. So cats are inherently a very territorial species and a lot of their behavior, whether it's at home or whether it's in the clinic, is driven by their highly territorial nature. And by the same um, token, they're not inherently social, at least not in the same way that people are and not in the same way that dogs um, are. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. They are acutely sensitive to sound and to smells. And uh, this is because, of course, uh, as a species, they occupy kind of a, a split personality in the animal world in that they're both a predator uh, but they're also a prey species. So they're a predator because they hunt, they're a true carnivore, um, they, you know, they need to uh, hunt and, and uh, eat prey every day, but they're small enough that they're also a prey species for larger animals, um, like dogs, for example. So you have to remember that every time a cat comes into your clinic, um, uh, in the, your cat's, your patient's mind, uh, they feel like they're going into an environment where they're surrounded by predators. And part of that defense mechanism or part of the, the, the toolkit that they have um, as they occupy that place in the animal world is the sensitivity to sound and scent. In a natural setting, they would uh, often lead fairly solitary lives. We're going to talk a little bit more about that and what impact that has on our patients as well. And so because of these things, they are relatively self-reliant. And that's both good and bad. Um, it's bad because uh, owners often see them uh, excessively as self-reliant or, or inappropriately as self-reliant, uh, and it means that cats have a great tendency to hide their signs of stress and hide their signs of illness. So often, you know, we don't get a chance to identify those problems until they're more advanced. So cats, on on uh, on average, are sicker by the time they present to a veterinarian for investigation of illness than a dog would be. We do have some nice data out of the UK on that. So part of that comes from inherent differences between cats and dogs. Is we'll just use dogs as a good uh, comparison species. So this is where we have to fight the species bias and how we think about our patients. Cats aren't humans, cats aren't dogs. And the numbers you can see on the screen there are the, the length of time uh, based on the, the best current knowledge we have that each of those species has been domesticated. So we have some evidence, archaeological evidence, that suggests that well, there were a number of separate domestication events for dogs that date back longer than 30,000 years. So there's some archaeological finds in Siberia, for example, and in Belgium, where uh, domesticated dog um, skeletons have been dated past 30,000 years. So dogs have a long history of living with people. Cats, about as far back, at least based on currently published data, that we can push that is maybe a maximum of 10,000 years. So they have lived with us and lived in that domesticated state only about a, a, a third of the amount of time uh, as, uh, as dogs have. And so there are some important implications from that. So dogs, of course, were domesticated by people. So we refined their wolf ancestry, took advantage of the traits in their, in their wolf ancestors, and turned those traits into breeds that are uh, uh, known for various tasks, whether it's hunting or guarding um, or herding or, or pulling sle uh, sleds, for example. So we deliberately um, shaped the domestication of the dog to suit certain purposes. But if we look at cats, it was just the opposite. I don't think we can actually say that we domesticated cats. I think it's the other way around. I think cats domesticated themselves to take advantage of food sources near people. So here's one of my patients who lives a, you know, a life that's probably not that much different from the lives that his ancestors lived for thousands of years. This guy's name is Fat Boy, and he lives on a farm, 
He's a, a typical barn cat. So um, cats probably or originally uh, learn to tolerate the close association with people because we had nice things like barns and we stored grain and that attracted uh, prey species that cats were um, interested in. So if you think about how domestication occurred, I think it's totally different um, in dogs and in cats. If we look at the closest living ancestor, wild ancestor to the domestic cat, it would be the Scottish wild cat. There's a dwindling population of wild cats. Felis sylvestris um, is this breed or uh, this species. And not very many of them left. There used to be a lot of European wild cats and African wild cats. Now we've, we're left with just a small population of Scottish wild cats. But if we look at the, these guys as the closest wild ancestor to the domestic cat, they live very solitary lives. You rarely see them together. You usually see a solitary cat like you see in this picture. You know, they do look pretty domestic. They look just like a tabby cat, although they're, they're bigger and, and uh, uh, their, their boning is uh, more... Uh, uh, heavier boned than a domestic cat, but even when there's a lot of food around, when food isn't you know uh, uh, isn't uh, scarce, when it's abundant, you don't see them in groups. You see them living fairly solitary lives. So many domestic cats still live very solitary lives, and you know here's um, examples of kind of two extremes. So one of the the things that happen with domestic cats is this plasticity or this flexibility to either continue to live that prototypical wildcat life, like the, the cat in the photo from Abu Simbel, which is a, a village in southern Egypt. I had the chance to be there about five years ago, and uh, I, I took a photograph one evening of this cat walking along this stone wall in this little village in southern Egypt, this, uh, this uh, feral cat. So he's living a life that's pretty much the same as his wild ancestors lived. But then in the other photo, you can see two of my patients. There's Carmelina and Rico, who are at the other end of the spectrum of the domestic cat in that they are sociable. They, uh, their uh, degree of domesticity is such that they uh, are happy to live with people. They're happy to live with each other. So we see this, this uh, spectrum of you, if you will, of domestication, and that's led a lot of people to say that the, you know your average domestic cat is probably only loosely domesticated. They're not as strongly domesticated as you will as as uh, as we would think of most dogs as being domesticated. Another thing that's really important to know about the way cats would choose to live is when they do live in social groups, they are based on female kinship. So any time that you would see a natural grouping of cats, it's going to be based on a queen and her offspring. So when they do live in loose colonies, they are matrilineal. They are queen-led. And they adapt the cat density and their, their organization, their spatial organization, to fit the environment. So how much space do they have? And to fit the available resources, particularly food resources. So they they are flexible enough to adapt their, um, their density and their organization to fit the needs um, of their environment. But when they do live in close association, it's usually uh, female kinship orient, uh, oriented. So in comparison to other species like cattle, for example, cattle are, uh, are herd species. So herd animals, pack animals like dogs, they are accustomed to close contact. They evolved that way. They have a toolkit uh, that's designed for group living. So all the tools, the social communication tools in their toolkit are designed to help them live together in a group, to have dominance hierarchies, for example. So they are adapted to living in close confinement, uh, a lot of animals in a smaller space. But if you look at cats, the only cat species, uh, whether it's big cats or little cats or domesticated or wild cats, that lives in a group at all is the lion. The lion is the exception. The lion is the only species that will hunt and live together, and it's usually females. Again, it's usually a matrilineal colony that lives together. They will hunt cooperatively, and they will eat together. But they are the exception. So most other species are doing what this guy is doing. This is a black-footed cat who's uh, urine marking, uh, very familiar 
you know, type of behavior, even with our domestic um, cat. So this is a, a little endangered cat called the black-footed cat. And, and I, I, you know, I show you that picture just to show you that the cat toolkit doesn't have a lot of tools for group living. It has tools to signal other cats to keep away, about marking your territory, about this is where I need to hunt and live, you keep out of here. So their toolkit is about telling other cats to keep their distance because they're obligate carnivores. They have a limited um, menu, a limited food menu compared to dogs or compared to herbivores. So their hunting and their breeding territory is really important for them to defend. And their, their social toolkit, if you will, um, has been populated or built up with tools to tell other cats to keep away. So they don't have a lot of tools that help them live in groups. They, they're, they're lacking in tools that people have, that dogs have, that herd animals have to help them live in groups. So this, uh, uh, this uh, kitty that you can see there, Tommy, who's uh, just been uh, hunting and has uh, caught some small little rodent there. Tommy belongs to a friend of mine. When Tommy's out hunting and he's catching his prey, he's not behaving really any differently from that large wild cat that's caught an antelope and has uh, hauled the antelope up in a tree because he does not want to share his kill. So our domestic cats still have a lot of that hardwired behavior that says I'm a solitary hunter, I hunt by myself, I eat by myself, and I will defend my home range. So we start to get into trouble when we ask cats to push that boundary and ask them to live really as a herd animal when their toolkit is based around being the solitary hunter. And I wanted to show you some interesting data that was collected just a, and published just a couple of years ago in a journal that you know I, I'm sure uh, most of you don't read, the Journal of Wildlife Management. But it's a really interesting little study where they put um, uh, collar-mounted activity sensors and they used radio telemetry on 11 owned cats, pet cats that had access to the outdoors, and 16 stray cats in uh, this uh, uh, area in uh, Illinois, Champaign and Urbana, and the uh, the area that those cats lived in is outlined by the the black uh, line on uh, on the um, the image that you can see in front of you. So that black outline is the uh, the area where those cats lived, and and what they were looking at was the home ranges of a pet cat that had access to outdoors versus a feral cat. So the pet cats, um, their home range is that little yellow dot that you can see there that averaged about five acres in size. The unowned cats, their range is that red outlined area, hugely different. So the unowned male cats ranged over about 388 acres, and the female cats ranged over about 138 acres. So you can see if they choose for themselves, they, they are not dependent on people for a food source. They have quite large home ranges, but even the pet cats who were fed at home, you know, who came home at night, still had uh, a surprisingly large area that they chose as their home range. It was five acres um, on average. Now, there's a lot of variation from cat to cat, and, and the size of a home range is going to be based on things like sex. Obviously, males have a bigger home range than females, uh, what the season is, how abundant food is, but I just show you that to show you the, the huge difference, but also to show you that even um, pet cats, own cats by choice, would have a larger home range than, for example, these two kitties. So uh, Buscott and Mandolin are, are two of my patients. They're uh, Himalayan cats you know, who live an indoor life, and their home range is not going to be anywhere near the five acres. So most indoor cats have really small home ranges. And if you think about it, many of our uh, clients keep cats at abnormally high population densities, much higher than the cats would choose for themselves, given the type of species that they are. So this is where these stressors start to enter their daily lives. This is some really interesting um, data that was actually published back in 1999 in a behavior journal, and it looked at pet cats. These are uh, pairs, 60 pairs of pet cats who lived indoor only lives, unrelated cats. Now remember the, the normal pattern for a cat would be to live in a matrilineal colony, yet we usually have unrelated cats living together. So these are 60 pairs of cats 
um, indoors only, not related. And they looked at the amount of time that these cats spent uh, with in sight or out of sight of each other. So here's two of my patients, India, who's a little black cat. You can see hiding back there in her tent. And Loki, India and Loki get along, but they need to spend time not just apart from each other, but out of sight of each other. And what they found in this study by looking at those 60 pairs of indoor cats is that they spend at least half of their time, they chose to spend at least half of their time out of sight of each other. They spent about 9% of their time within 10 to 16 feet and 40% of their time within 10 feet of each other. So even cats that know each other, that live together, that get along, still have a high need for, for me time or alone time. And, and we do see stress come into the lives of these cats when owners don't understand that and when owners don't provide for that. So this is part of the, the, basement, the basis of, of the, these uh, concepts of uh, environmental enrichment for cats, for example. Part of it is providing the uh, resources so that they can have this type of alone time. So here's a, a little uh, comic that says, uh, a cartoon that says, Jenny is the new kid in class everybody hiss until you get used to her. So it's really common for us to see both behavior problems and problem behaviors in feline medicine. And a lot of the behavior problems that we see are, are not necessarily abnormal behaviors. They're normal behaviors. They're just unwanted or objectionable, but they're a normal expression of the cat's response to its environment.